Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the latest Predictable Revenue webinar. My guest today is Eleanor Stutz. Uh, she's a motivational, inspirational speaker, a sales trainer, CEO of Smooth Sale, and best selling author of multiple works, including Nice Girls Do Get the Sale, Relationship Building That Gets Results, and Hired How to Use Sales Techniques to Sell Yourself on Interviews. Welcome, Eleanor. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation, Sarah. I'm yeah, really glad to have you on. Um, Eleanor's mission is to connect with other leaders and help younger generations advance their careers with the underlying goal of promoting equality from the executive suite to the board to the company as a whole. So our discussion today is going to center around two topics. Number one being the barriers to inequality and how leadership can help overcome them and help enable every employee to achieve their career goals. And the second topic being the fundamentals of selling and how we can apply them to the hiring process. So if any of you out there are looking to give your career a boost or you're interested in finding new opportunities or you're a leader that wants to make sure they're doing right by their employees, time to start taking notes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> <Awesome>. you. <laughs> So to start us off, Eleanor, um, tell me about the lessons you learned in the corporate world and how you came to write Nice Girls Do Make the Sale. Uh, well, the, the overall lesson I learned is that everyone's a decision maker. It doesn't matter if it's the person smoking outside, the person in the basement or the guard with guns. They all make decisions and they're the first people who will decide whether you get into the executive suite or not. They have input, believe it or not. And uh, the biggest error was that people treat people as if they belong to a totem pole. Mm -hmm. But when you treat everybody unmistakably with kindness and respect, it's amazing how far you will go. Whether you know the most or you know the least, it doesn't matter. It's amazing. the respect and kindness that matters. Amazing. And you have quite a story of um, kind of well, first, how you got into sales in the first place and then kind of the adversity that you faced along the way that um, contributed to, to all the ideas that went into that book. Can you give us a bit of that, that outline, give us a bit of your, your story from, from the beginning to that book? Sure. It's kind of comical. Um, it was quite a while ago. I, I was a stay-at-home mom initially, an entrepreneur. And my husband came home one night, I'm typing on the computer, and I hear him say to my disbelief, Eleanor, I know what you should do to earn money. You have the personality of a salesperson. I got up, looked him straight in the eye, and I asked, is that a compliment or an insult? <laughs> I wasn't sure where it was coming from. Over time, I realized it's a huge compliment because salespeople are unique, the ones who excel, they're the ones who know how to listen and how to get the most conversation out of a person so that they can then provide a robust solution. Mm -hmm. And it turned out he was right. So it took me six interviews to get my first job to sell an unknown brand copier door to door. And I actually had to corner the sales director into hiring me. That's another story. <laughs> <clears throat> and then the treatment got really bad. <clears throat> Excuse me. I was a pioneer woman on all male sales team. I wasn't wanted. I was expected to fail. And so I wasn't provided training. That was actually a blessing in disguise because <clears throat> the training wasn't stellar in my opinion. So in the old days, you went and knocked on doors in your territory. And I'd always ask why I was invited in so I'd know what to repeat. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was selling, so I had great conversations, including asking people what motivated them to get into the industry they're in and how they got their job so I would know how to interview better, ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. So I was gaining two things at the same time. I was learning how to interview better, plus I was learning how to sell. Since I didn't know how to sell to someone, I asked how they buy from somebody. And I got individualized training from each prospect. So you can imagine what works better, individualized training or corporate, you know, at one size fits all. By the fourth month, I still didn't know what I was selling or how to sell, but I was the top producer. That made the men really angry. And then the games got worse. So I'll fast forward to how I got to writing Nice Girls Do Get the Sale. 
I became an entrepreneur after 11 years of the ugliness. And my very first event, I foolishly said, I'm a sales trainer. And the men couldn't stop laughing. They were doubled over. And the women ran away from me, shrieking, believing I must be highly manipulative. None of the above was true. But someone kindly took me aside and said, Eleanor, to establish credibility, you have to write a book. My phone wasn't ringing, so I wrote a book. And I wrote it in four months. Nobody could believe it. And the book broke all records. It became an international bestseller, was featured in Time magazine, and it translated into four languages. And the reason was women around the world were having the same issues. The book today broke another record, it's evergreen. So um, it did well. And it's because I opened up, it was from a Dale Carnegie speaking class that I learned, be yourself, share your best and your worst stories, and then your relationships will build, your network will increase, and good things will follow. And so that's the title of the book, Nice Girls Do Get the Sale, Relationship Building That Gets Results. Yeah, what an incredible way to kind of prove all those people wrong and at the same <laughs> time provide the next generation of saleswomen with a, an amazing piece of literature and a piece of inspiration. Yeah, I think that's so amazing. Um, you had one story that was pretty funny um, that kind of, I felt, really encompassed the way the men kind of felt about you in that role. Um, it was the story, you had a, a friend or a colleague who recommended you take 100% commission. Could you tell that little... Uh, little oh, story? yes. It was actually on my better job. I was uh, hired. I was supposed to accept a base salary that was insulting to anybody's intelligence. And another female, thankfully, took me aside and said, take 100% commission. That way, everything's on you, and or you can be rewarded for doing a good job. So I thought, well, so far, I've done a good job. I'll try it here. And I selected 100% commission. Well, a number of months into the job, my manager had the nerve to come over to me and complain I was earning more money than he. <laughs> so... <laughs> I was doing pretty well. <laughs> well, good. Good for you. Um, tell us um, a couple of the core ideas that we might find in that book. For people out there that are thinking about put, adding that to their little book rotation, what can they hope to, to read about in there? Uh, mainly, first and foremost, take the high road on any situation. Know your standards, your set of ethics, where you draw the line and what you're not going to do. If you need to quit a job, quit it. That's what I did in my past. But most of all, be open to listen, even to the most unusual ideas. Everybody has different thought. We're all unique. And let the other person speak first so you gain their perspective. And from that, I call it a friendly negotiation throughout the sales cycle so that you're not um, strong arming somebody at the end. You get their ideas, and then when you see where your product or services may fit in, at, don't tell them about it. Ask them, have you ever thought about? And then have a more engaging dialogue. And when somebody says something that reminds you of a prior experience, stop the sales conversation and take them to the experience that you had. Let them comment on it, find out if they had similar experiences so that you build a bond between you. And then last but not least, sometimes people will use jargon that we don't understand. So what a good strategy to do is to ask them what they mean by it so you get full and depth understanding. A perfect example was someone was on an interview and he was asked about the sugar and spice software that was new. And he said, oh yeah, I was just trained on it very in depth and I got certified. And the hiring manager said, thank you very much for that feedback. Now I know you're not a fit for our company because I just made that all up. Mm -hmm. So honesty, honesty comes first. 
Amazing. So definitely the the key, and it's in the title, um, is the relationship building. And I think that's especially important uh, in the current climate. There's been a big shift away from, you know, selling and much more towards empathetic messaging and, and relationship building. So definitely a great time to pick up Eleanor's book. Um, at the end, we will hold up the book so that you can see them. We'll share a link as well to Amazon where you can find them. And also just another note, if any of you have any questions at any point, feel free to drop them in the Q&A and we'll make sure to leave a little bit of time at the end to answer some of those questions. Um, so Eleanor, one of your kind of famous quotes is believe become empower. Tell me about that quote. Oh, okay. It changed my life as a result of a near-death experience, highly unusual. I was the victim of two car accidents and I had a neck that doctors didn't want to touch, but the second accident was the icing on the cake. I was in ER and my family was taken in to be consulted and I heard them bursting into sobs. But meanwhile, I had two visions come to me. The first was of me being a speaker and in my mind, I said, yes, that's what I always wanted to do. And with that, the uh, vision faded, a gold light encased my entire body. It was brilliant. I'll never forget it. And then a second vision came up that showed my life marks. I was proud that on the left-hand side, um, I had very high marks. But on the right-hand side, it was deeply embarrassing. It was entitled community service, but it was completely blank. So in the moment... I pledge to the great beyond or in my mind, whatever you want to call it, I will begin giving back to communities any way I may. But I'm the sales professional and the negotiator. I said, but enabled to give back to communities, I have to be able to walk out of this hospital on my own. And with that, the second vision faded, the gold light went away. And to me, it was all a signal that I would walk out of the hospital. Well, there's a, a long story attached to this, but the next morning I was heavily medicated and told I'd have a minute to meet the surgeon. I was expecting words of encouragement. Instead, I heard, Mrs. Stutz, most likely you will be paralyzed. And being a salesperson, I hear the underlying meaning. Just most likely? I'm thinking, he doesn't believe I'm going to survive at all. And given the night before experience, I said to him, with every ounce of energy left in me, doctor, when I wake up, I fully expect to be well. And the last thing I remember was some jumping backwards. Nobody in their right mind would speak to a surgeon about to cut them open <laughs> <laughs> that way. Anyways, hours later, was standing over me, and he said, Mrs. Stutz, there's no explanation for what just happened, but you will be able to walk out of this hospital in four days. You are a walking miracle. Okay. So I am grateful for every single day, and I always remembered my promise to help people any way I might. So what community service did you decide to do? I began with... I became an expert on interviewing because at the end of each job that I had in corporate for 11 years, my hard-earned accounts were given to the men and my quota tripled. So there was a need to interview and I quickly realized that interviewing follows the sales cycle. So my community service became helping job seekers sell themselves on interviews and take them through the cycle of how that is done. One story, though, there was a gentleman, an IT guy, no less, was in one audience, and he said, this is crap. I don't believe it, but I just came to prove it to myself. Mm -hmm. I said, thank you. I appreciate your time. Please wait till after everybody leaves after the event, and I'd like to ask you if you still think it's crap. I'd really like your opinion. So he did wait. And we had a very nice conversation. He said, I owe you a deep apology. That was amazing what you shared. And all the thank you notes that I received over time after the fall of the economy around 2008 and it started to climb back, that's when I wrote the book Hired because I realized it did help a lot of people. Amazing. Well, a little bit later in the conversation, we're going to dig into that and, and dig into the kind of how to apply these fundamentals of sales into uh, the hiring process. But I do want to touch a little bit on um, the kind of the inequality that you faced and, and that kind of inspired this goal in you to promote equality 
um, across the executive suite on the board, across the workplace in general. Um, so why do you think back when you started and even still today, why do you think that sales is a, a male dominated industry? I think the stereotypical persona, and that's what I had in my mind originally, was a, uh, a male, strong, nonstop talking, kind of a bully. And I think for some reason that kind of state is the stereotype in corporate. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't sell well. It's the understanding and asking questions that sells. So with that persona, not too many women want to enter the sales arena. Those who do are, are brave. I'm calling myself brave. <laughs> but um, you have to be really know who you are, be your authentic self, and stand up for yourself. That's the other piece. Not enough people are willing to speak up when they see a wrong. And we always have to be willing to do that. But I have to say that was part of my personality as a child, and I never lost it. And what do you think, um, why do you think having the diversity of men and women on a sales team is so important? What do you think that, that women can kind of uniquely bring to the table on a sales team? Well, we definitely think differently, but we can learn from each other. And when you learn from one another and you add in people of different cultures and different ethnic backgrounds, you have a much wider perspective and you can speak intelligently to more people. And so in my teenagehood, I didn't fit in in the town that I was in. So at age 16, I began traveling. And over time, I traveled to many countries. And that, too, enabled me to speak to a wider variety of people. And they were amazed. Uh, one person was at the SBA in San Francisco. She happened to mention she was originally from Peru. I had actually taken a class language of the Incas in college. And I uttered a sentence in Quechua to her. She almost fell off the chair. And next thing I knew, she gave me a list of referrals. So you want to be able to speak to as many different types of people as possible, get their perspectives, and then you can have a more intelligent conversation when you meet a wider variety of people. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that ties back into the great relationship building piece. Another thing that is so important today is that we've got this wide perspective um, that we can understand when reaching out to people in the current situation. Uh, you can kind of reach out with the knowledge that different people have been affected financially, emotionally, mentally, in, in physically, even in different ways in, in today's climate. And so important to have varying uh, uh, experiences and perspectives, I think. Exactly. So in the team meetings, don't just dis disregard people with crazy ideas. Ask why they are saying it. Mm -hmm. What has been their experience? How do they think it's actually going to work? You'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. So how do you think um, over the course of your career, how do you feel equality in the workplace has changed or progressed in that time? Well, <laughs> I have to tell you, there was a point where I was very far removed from corporate. And as I circled back, I began to ask people. I was sure it had advanced from where I was, but sadly it has not. And I was very disheartened. So in my estimation, we're all at fault. It's not just on the men, the women too. We need to speak up. Uh, we need to as I said earlier, know what our boundaries are, know where to draw the line, what's acceptable. For example, a number of years ago, I had a job interview just to see what was going on in the world. And the fellow in the hotel asked the concierge to tell me to go up to the 10th floor to meet him in his room. And I said to the concierge, please repeat my words to him call him up and tell him I expected a professional meeting and to meet me down in the lobby. You have to speak up or ugly things can happen. Mm -hmm. So by the time he came downstairs, I knew I was going to leave, but I decided I was just going to play with him a little bit on the interview. 
And then I told him I had no interest and I left. Great. So how do you think then that leaders today can encourage um, a culture of equality and how can we encourage a culture where women can speak up and where they, they feel the confidence to do that? I believe that on interviews, the hiring manager and the recruiter should ask what your career goals are. And then the sales manager or someone dedicated to coaching should work with each employee and check in how they're doing with their clientele if they're in sales, check that they're meeting their monthly goals and mentor them along the way and tie it into what the employee wants to achieve ultimately and set higher goals rather than just meeting quota, set career goals for them to help them move forward. And ultimately, why I think, oh, that's going to cost the company too much money if management spends their time or they dedicate somebody to helping with a career. On the other side of the coin, employees will be loyal. They'll stay. You're not going to have the revolving door syndrome that costs companies a bloody fortune. Mm-hmm. So everybody wins. That's, that's a, been a kind of conversation that has been coming up more and more frequently uh, specific to the sales development representative role. Um, I think even a guest on our podcast with Aaron Ross chatted about this, but the SDR role is one that uh, particularly is susceptible to that revolving door, as you put it. Um, And one of the the things that I believe it was Colin Cadmus of Air Call, uh, he said, to to focus on what the career path would be and to offer mentorship and to offer growth in that role would mean that you would, you'd have more people sticking around and there would be more loyalty. Um, you'd have better SDRs as a result. And I think it absolutely ties into what you're saying. Um, no role should be kind of viewed as an entry level role or, and kind of be stuck right there, but every single role should be viewed as a, a stepping stone role. And every leader should be taking an, an active role in the development of all of their employees. Absolutely. And the, in the what's ironic, the very worst job that I had, I had the best sales coach. Mm-hmm. And because he mentored me, I met with him every single week and um, he gave me ideas and he encouraged me. And at at the right time, he would tell me I was doing a good job if I was. Otherwise, he'd tell me how to improve. And all of his suggestions stayed with me the remaining years in a sales career. Yeah, that's great. I do feel fortunate. And you and I chatted about this um, a couple of days ago. But I think at Predictable Revenue, we have a very strong emphasis on on culture and, and on personal and professional growth. Um, I think we're, yeah, offered great opportunity and our, everyone from the kind of top level executives uh, to pers- to lower level managers, all that kind of thing, are very involved in helping us grow. And having this conversation with you, I, I realize how fortunate I am to be at a company like that because absolutely that's not the case for women everywhere in the industry. Um, whether that be in the past or even still today, I think there there are so many um, barriers to inequality, but hopefully leaders will start to kind of take initiative and, and just treat everybody as, as on a, a good trajectory. Yeah, I just have to add, you are very fortunate because that's highly unusual and it ties into the name of the company, Revenue Growth. It's perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great segue for us to switch on to your second book, which was Hired. Um, So tell me about how you came to write that second book. Well, it was all of the community service that I did for a number of years. And as I mentioned previously, the market fell dramatically. And uh, but the thank you notes kept coming through, which encouraged me to write the book. And so I did, and then I waited for the right time to have it published. And I have a funny story, if you don't mind my telling you. Um, it was It's a sales story underneath it. So um, we were going to meet my husband's friends in Las Vegas one year, shortly after the book was published. And our daughter is in the uh, hospitality industry. And she said, oh, mom, you don't want to go to Vegas then because President Obama's going to be there. It's going to be jam-packed. 
So I said, she said, reschedule. Instead of saying, okay, I said, really, which hotel will we be at? <laughs> um, I took several copies of my books and I went up to concierge to ask if I'd get a copy in his hand because it was just right after the big fall. And they said, oh, no, 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 you can't even speak to security. Nope, you have to leave. Okay. So then I thought about it. I went back to what I said previously, people think in terms of totem poles. Mm. So I went to supposedly the bottom level person. Who would that be? Concierge. But not any concierge person, a female concierge person. And I went up to her and I said, a lot of people are jobless. They're trying to get back to work. And my book was written with their goals in mind. And I'm hoping you can get a copy into President Obama's hands, even if you go through security first. The country's counting on you that this gets in front of many. And she said, oh, my goodness, that's incredible. I can't guarantee it. I said, it's okay. Please take the copy. And for you, I'll give you a copy of my other book, Nice Girls Do Get the Sale. And she took them. And she said, no promises. I said, that's fine. And I walked away and I did leave the hotel at that point. Well, a month later, I got letters on White House stationery from President Obama and from Michelle Obama thanking me for the effort I put in. And those letters are on my wall. How it was the best sales job I ever did. But yeah. <laughs> With incredible clothes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I'm wow. very proud of that. I bet. Yeah, you should be. Um, so what are the the fundamentals then of the selling process that you think best apply to the hiring process? Okay, I'm going to give you a very simplistic story. I started out selling Girl Scout cookies briefly. And the very first person was overweight. And she said to me, oh, honey, I really want to support you, but I can't. The doctor told me I can't eat sugar. So I said, okay. And I just stood on her porch staring at her. And she said, is something the matter? And I said, no, but if you don't mind my asking, I'm kind of curious, do you have nieces or nephews? And she said, yeah, why? I said, or even grandchildren, sure. So I said, well, don't you think they might visit more often if you keep cookies in the pantry? She said, oh, my God, you're good. And she took a number of boxes. So the point is, put yourself in your prospect's shoes. Think about where they're coming from, the pros and cons, why they're saying no, how you might overcome the objection, and just have a friendly conversation. I tell everybody, yes or no works for me. I just need to know your reasoning. And that way you can work with the reasoning. It can open up doors. Right. And so how would you um, apply those that kind of logic to uh, the hiring process? How would, you, how would somebody go about maybe selling themselves or, or overcoming objectives like that in the, in the interview or hiring process? Uh, I can't think of an objection. All that comes to mind are the crazy questions I get asked or used to get asked. Like, if you were in a jungle, what kind of animal would you like to be? So if you're applying for sales, um, my answer was, I'd love to be a giraffe. They're graceful when they run, beautiful coat of fur. And most importantly, most salespeople are accused of just going for low-hanging fruit, but because the giraffe is so tall, it can get the high-hanging apples off the trees. What do you think about that answer? Wow, that's creative and good. The other crazy question was, would you rather be a kamikaze pilot or an ice cream truck driver? I had to stop five minutes to think about that on a personality test. And I put myself in the shoes of a salesperson and I couldn't believe it. I don't want to kill myself, but I said kamikaze pilot because you have to take risk on the job trying to get into big companies if you want them on your resume. Mm -hmm. So when I was hired, that manager said to me, I don't know whether to be thrilled to pieces you're on my team or scared to death of you. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So 
but you have to put yourself in the shoes of the questions being asked and of the interviewing party mm -hmm. and try to engage them in conversations instead of having these questions fired at you one after another. Mm -hmm. Try to find out how they took their job, why, what they like about it, what they look for in prospective clients, what makes the best hire. Try to get answers from them. Have a two-way conversation instead of just asking questions. That helps enormously. So again, all about relationship building. Yes, always. The most important thing. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how can a young professional uh, with ambitions to move up to the executive suite uh, set themselves apart from their potentially even more mature or more experienced colleagues? Okay, learn, take as much time as you can to learn. Um, you know, study at night on the weekend. Always have your goals set. You know what you want to achieve each day for the quarter, for the year and observe how other people are working. And one of my secrets was to take the top performer at the beginning of a new job out to lunch and ask how he became so successful. But this is terrible to say, I used to order wine for them. I don't drink, but I'd order wine for them. And when they started drinking, they start sharing their best tips. <laughs> and then I knew what to model. <laughs> You know, the, the, same, the same is true at Christmas parties. People drink like crazy and then blast everything they know that they shouldn't be telling you. Mm -hmm. And you just listen. And then you take the best of what you hear and apply it to your unique style. You always have to come across as authentic. And when you do that, you have the better strategies to apply. So if a young professional or, or any professional kind of on that path is taking bits and pieces of what they're learning and they're trying to develop their own style and they're trying to figure out what strategy is the right one, how would you say that you know that you're on the right path? How can you be sure that what you're doing is the right thing? Um, a good way is to get confirmation from your clientele or, yeah, from the people you're working with and ask, did I answer all your questions? Is there anything I left unanswered? Do you need more insight? Do I need to do more research for you? Uh, and what would you suggest that I can do to improve? Don't take it like it's a criticism. Take it as usable feedback so that you can improve each day. Make it your goal to get better the next day. So for anybody out there right now who's looking to make a career move, what are your top three tips for writing a great resume? <laughs> My top tip is write it all out and then research online, perhaps use Yelp for the best resume services because styles change all the time. And I'm not really up to date, but hire a good resume service. In fact, here's another tip. You can sometimes research it on Living Social or Groupon so it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg and get a good service at a reasonable cost and see what they provide you. In most instances, you'll be very happy with it or you may want to change it up a tiny bit, but take the feedback that they give you uh, with strict attention and that should help you get in the door. And I think you mentioned before as well um, the necessity to reach out or look for one of these resume professionals uh, in the industry that you're applying into um, because kind of the jargon might be different, the way that uh, they like to see their resumes might be different. And while you might be completely knowledgeable about how to rate, write a great resume for you know sales, if you're moving into an engineering role, probably best to get help from an expert in that field. Absolutely. Yeah. You want to research the industry and the people who can pinpoint the help that you need. Great. And what would your top three tips be for nailing an interview? <laughs> Get sleep if you can. I know everybody's filled with nerves. Practice smiling in the mirror using some gestures, but don't memorize anything and have some stories about how you previously helped somebody in a similar situation that they will be hiring you for and what 
perhaps the learning curve was on your end, maybe a struggle you had. The better part would be is if you brought in people to help, uh, whether you did or not, and tell it in an engaging story format and share it with the person. And But then don't end there. The most important question is, now that you heard my story, do I sound like the type of candidate you might like to hire? A sales technique is to go after three to five buy-ins. Those are many agreements. And that would be one agreement that, yes, you're the type of candidate we are looking for. And then you can further the conversation by asking, so what are the other things that you're seeking for this role so that I know whether I'm a good fit for you? And they're going to want to take it to another level because now it looks like you're trying to help them. Mm -hmm. Amazing. All great <laughs> tips for watch out predictable revenue because I'm on the growth path. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, telling us about yeah your tips for, for career growth. Thank you so much for discussing um, the barriers to equality and, and how leaders can kind of help address that. Thank you so much for all of your amazing, entertaining stories uh, of how you got to write those two books. Maybe now would be a great time to show everybody um, the covers of the two books. Um, we will share uh, links to the Amazon pages for these two books so that you guys can take a look um, and you can read them yourselves. And if anybody has any questions, doesn't look like we have anything in the uh, Q&A right now, but if anything comes to mind, feel free to drop that in. Um, Eleanor, if people want to reach out to you, if they, if they have questions that they think of after this, how can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? Oh, excuse me. Uh oh, Sorry about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> my email is Eleanor, E-L-I-N-O-R, at smoothsale.net, S-M-O-O-T-H-S-A-L-E.net. And I'm very happy to answer you. I'm on LinkedIn uh, under my name and on Twitter as smoothsale, all one word. So those are the better ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. And Eleanor's blog is also on her website, which is smoothsale.net. Um, and it looks like we do have one question. Um, feel free to type that out, Jane, and we'll ask it to Eleanor. Oh, it looks like Andrew just bought the book. Amazing. Thank you, Andrew. That was quick and appreciated. Let me know if you have questions about it. Um, so in the Q&A, it looks like Jane said a question is on the Q&A. I can only find one question on the Q&A from Paul Lee, um, which is what are some challenges or mistakes SDRs make when coming into the role and how do we fix those mistakes? Um, what is an SDR? SDR would be sales development representative. So uh, oh. it would be like a prospecting role somebody who just uh, generates new business, but doesn't uh, necessarily close the deals. Okay, so the errors in which capacity, I'm sorry. Um, Paul, feel free to chime in here if you, if you can specify. Um, but I think maybe this might be on kind of career growth. Um, kind of, yeah, how to, how to set yourself on the right career path. We did chat a little bit about how an SDR is one of those roles that often is a revolving door. Um, so maybe how, how to prevent that, how to make sure that you're kind of growing and, and can move into a different role and stay with the company. Okay. So uh, one suggestion is every evening in your quiet time, analyze what you did, what went well, and what didn't go so well. Mirror the next day what went well and try to revise what you did. Think about if you can, when you can, get feedback and then um, restructure how you approach things. Ask questions of management who's willing to help you and keep reading uh, different sales related books on how you can improve. But most of all, talk to your clientele, ask them. After each appointment, honest to goodness, they'll be shocked, but they'll be thrilled to help you. Ask them how you might approve. You're fairly new and you want to get their input. 
So because you, with their input, you can help them even better. And they will give you advice. Some will be good and some won't. But keep asking questions, observe people, and take the best to what will work for your style. Awesome. So not everything will be good for you, but what does will work. And then keep resetting goals. And I do have a bonus if you'd like me to share it with you. Is um, At the first networking event, everybody predicted I would fail within a couple of months and be looking for a new job. And nine months later, I went back to a similar event, the same group, and they said, oh, my God, you're advancing your business at lightning speed. How did you do it? So I thought back to my career and how I was able to make quick advancements. And I created the laser goal setting system. It's now in the form of a, of a postcard. And I'd be happy to share it if anybody wanted it. That would be amazing. Maybe um, I can get that from you and we can make sure that that's shared uh, after the sure. broadcast. Um, Paul Lee did specify um, what are the common mistakes people make when interviewing. And I think I can speak to this because I interviewed as an SDR relatively recently. Um, I think the biggest uh, quality that an SDR needs to show is uh, coachability. And after that is adaptability or agility or creativity or, or kind of however you'd want to look at that. So with an SDR role, you don't necessarily need to come from a, a big background in, in sales, but you do need to show that you can learn quickly and that you are, are creative. The SDR role one thing will not work month after month. You've got to be able to try different strategies, uh, take on everything that you learn and then kind of rework it to fit your own um, process. So if you can come into that interview with examples of when you've uh, been faced with a challenge or a problem and how you creatively solve that problem, that would be fantastic. And uh, come with an example of something that you've learned that was difficult. The example that I brought in was that I was a, a server before my job at Predictable Revenue, but I was trying to move into bartending at that job. So uh, our the uh, bar that I worked in had a very large whiskey selection, and so I had become really knowledgeable about whiskeys. And so that was just an example that I used of something that I knew nothing about and then had ended up being an expert in. I think those types of stories will be really valuable for you uh, interviewing as an SDR. We have one more question that came in, and that was, how does one foster culture and growth for SDRs with the stigma of it being entry level or with the fact that it is a high turnover role? Um, do you have anything uh, to say to that, Eleanor? I would say uh, when I was in sales, we had weekly meetings and everybody's opinion should be <laughs> included. It wasn't at that time. And then perhaps quarterly, have team events, have a picnic, have a sports thing, whatever it might be, so that there's camaraderie among everyone. It helps tremendously. Even a potluck lunch, it will help. I think absolutely. From a leadership perspective, that's 100% the responsibility of, of management and leadership is to create that culture where everybody is equal, um, the team can all chat and socialize and learn from one another. Um, I think from the SDR perspective, um, the SDR is the basically on the front lines when it comes to reaching out to cold customers. So you're the one who knows better than anybody the kind of pains that uh, your customers are facing. Um, you're the one who sees what works and what doesn't when you're chatting to these people. So I think SDRs are very, very vital to the entire sales process. Um, and kind of shouldn't be viewed as entry level at all because of that. You're, there's no way that your account executive or your closing team is going to have any opportunities to even look at if you're not doing a great job. So as long as you are consistently hitting your quota, um, you're showing that you're taking initiative to own your own growth and learn new things. Um, I think that you should be able to kind of blow out of that, that entry level box. And there is high turnover. Um, because people view it as an entry level role, but if there seems to be some kind of growth path available to you in your company, make yourself uh, invaluable and, and prove that you can move up. And I think your company will respond to that positively. That's a gr great answer. Absolutely. 
Awesome. Well, if anyone has any last minute questions, thank you so much to you guys that asked those questions. They were great. Um, we can answer those. Otherwise, we will share um, the couple of resources that we've mentioned. We'll share the links to the books. We'll share, um, I'll get that uh, lightning goal setting um, card from you. And then we will share that uh, with the listeners as well. Going once. Going <laughs> once. Anybody? I think that's it. Well, that thank you. So highly much. enjoyable. Thank you so much. Great conversation. I wish everybody much success. And I'm always happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Eleanor. So you know how to find Eleanor if you do have any more questions. Uh, if you have any questions for me specific to that SDR track, then you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, send me a connection request. I'll answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for being a guest today, Eleanor. This is wonderful. And thank you so much to everybody who tuned in and watched today. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.